sitting up there saying, play, okay, but I sure hope he talks about. Do you already feel like you're leaving here with something to think about as you consider in your practice? Does anybody think that this has been a total waste of their life? <laughs> And you guys do get up being like trying to be funny with stuff. Like, uh, a friend and I used to, a friend of mine and I used to do this stuff together all the time, and then he would die. Um, weak. And we used to argue with each other all the time. And sometimes he would say, oh my god, why would they have two guys show up that don't like each other? So we'd have to say to people, no, it's actually a sign of, it's a good sign when you can have an argument with somebody. You didn't argue and yell. We'd be like, no, I don't hear that. Because I think that's you know, part of the whole point is that what we're really trying to do is uh, to think differently. And sometimes it's hard when you need to put it in So does anybody have anything, like I said, we have an hour. And I don't know if you guys got this. I can talk. <laughs> but it would be, I'd be happy to say, is there anything that you would like me to, anybody have any questions or anything that they'd like to have to address? Anybody else? <laughs> Go ahead. I thought last night we were going to ask if I need to go down to that. But um, one of the goals, and I won't use that's the wrong term, but one of the things that people say to us is that they want to kill themselves. Right. How does that fit into how you look at it? Does it fit into integrate the idea that some people are suicidal. Yeah. Okay, well let's think about that in part. Question number one is, is the person, so I mean, there's all the risk assessment part that we always talk about, we've been talking about. First question I always ask is, is this somebody that is legitimately wanting to indicate that they want to kill themselves, or is this somebody that's saying, I'm really unhappy, and I'm desperately trying to get something? So there's a series of questions that you know that you have to ask, or you have a plan, all the other kind of stuff. And you know, by the way, we had, you know, in school we had, we had a, a girl came in one day and said, I really want to kill myself, did a plan and stuff like that, and it was 911, emergency intervention, do not pass go. She was really unhappy, but it was like, you know, we love you, but we don't want you to die. Um, so the first question is, like, what do you do in terms of trying to figure out how much of this is because of one thing or another? So, it's a question, in a lot of ways, it's a question of what's the, what's the quality of the relationship that you have with the person. So we often will say, okay, you really told me something that's really, this is a big deal, this is a really, really big deal. So we need to just try to figure out what we can do to make sure that you're safe. So the first thing I want you to know is that we're concerned about your safety, and I'm going to do everything I can from now until we're all feeling comfortable that you're going to be sick. And we, we start there, because we don't start, a lot of times what happens is people get into the, sort of the clinical part of it, is that, there's the human part, which is that really worries me. I'm worried. And what we need to do is we need to figure out what can I do to address my worry, or what can I do to address your worry? And so you know, you know we ask a series of questions, and of course they're basic kind of questions. So you said this today, when did this first start? How do you feel this stuff? By the way, anybody know the literature about suicide? No. There's actually some really interesting stuff that's been done on the University of Minnesota. The average suicide occurs within five minutes of the decision to commit suicide. Wow. Wow. So most people say they want to commit suicide, actually don't. Can I just ask, you know, so you know that? Yeah, how do you know that? Yeah. And it's also a function of 
are there lethal ways to get yourself out available immediately? So many people who attempted suicide unsuccessfully would say that, you know, I had tried in different ways and I would collect things, but I never really got to the point, so I said I'm going to do this and then I did. So, how long? What's going on? Is something different? Um, you ask a series of those questions. It's the same kind of thing. It's, it's the same framework, but this framework that you're not trying to go to say, what are we going to do to treat this? It's going to be, what are we going to do to make sure this person's um, safe? And what are we going to do to make sure that I'm responding in a way that's responsible given the risks that are associated with this kind of stuff? Um, so it's a similar thing, but we have, I mean, we have, you know, in our substance abuse program, we have lots of people who will come in and say they're suicidal. And what they really are is depressed or upset. A lot of times, you know, what often, again, in our experience, is that what often sort of instigates that is something a negative event that happened pretty close. So whether it's my wife left me, my boyfriend left me, uh, I used again and I almost overdosed and I'm sick and tired of myself. I mean, there's a bunch of things around those kind of things. But you know, we immediately get them. We, you know, 100% of the time we call if they have a mental health provider, we talk to them. Um, 100% of the time we tell people. By the way, we tell everybody, here's what we're going to do now. And I think, again, that goes back to the dignity of it, which is I just want you to know we're really we're worried that because we're worried, we're going to do certain things. And we tell people, by the way, we're also mandated reporters, so this is what we have to do now. And it's kind of interesting, you know, we, I've never, well, I shouldn't say that, no, it's a whole different story, but, um, let, you know, over the last 15 years plus, nobody's, you know, we've been, but intervening, and a lot of the people that will say that, they were like, I like the way you handled it, you didn't, you didn't go crazy, but you were, like, really clear. So there's no simple, yeah? One of my employees tried to hang themselves and said that night, he came back to work today. Oh, he's a tough one. Yeah. I'm going to see you tomorrow. <clears throat> how open should I be about what he tried to do? You can ask him, how open should I be? There's no answer. There is no answer. I don't know him. I don't know you. I don't know the circumstance. And for me to stand in front of you and say, here's what you need to do, well, I'll tell you what I would do. I would look and say, okay, we're, I, I, same thing. I really care. I'm really worried. How can I help? I'm really cared. I'm really worried. What do you want me to know? I'm really cared. I'm really worried. What should other people know? I'm really cared. I'm really worried. What do you want to do? And that, that would be the way I would frame it. Are you feeling okay? Are you want some time off? We'd like to, you're, you're welcome here as you want to be. Um, but people are going to wonder what's going on. How do you want to handle it? Because that's, again, you're, you know, you're giving control back to someone who said his life is out of control. Someone who wants to take your life and say, my life is out of my control. And the more you can start to try to give them a sense that I'm trying the best I can to try to give you a sense of control and that we're not doing this in a negative way and this isn't, this is, boy, we're really worried. And what can we do to help you? But I, don't, I wish, I, I mean, there is no right answer. There is no right answer. There is no right answer. Yep. Um, well, Rehab, we did some work uh, a couple of years ago with the Neuro Behavioral Rehab Service in the UK. We came out here to pilot a model there. It, to my knowledge, it hasn't really established in Australia because essentially the difference is in the way that we fund the services. Is it a company before? Sorry? Who was it? Brain Injury Rehabilitation Trust, BERT. And it was it was a very intensive no. measuring. Oh, no, the progress. Yeah. No. Um, but uh, they claim, and I don't know if you can demonstrate considerable success in the UK, but it's whether, whether Intensely mapping behaviors and trying to look at the triggers for yep. for those behaviors and, and then developing strategy around which is an to sort of some of the, the free form uh, intuitive. Yep. I think, I, yeah, I, you know, there's something I'm trained as behavior. And I think that what you want to try to do is say, what are the best practices that we can integrate in, what's, in what we're doing here? One of the concerns that we've had, in, you know, that, that, here's, the, here is the enigma of evidence. So there's a whole evidentiary base that says you can do these kinds of things for people with behavior problems and it works. And then there's another group of people that say, no, that's not. Here's some evidence that shows do this, and this works. And there's another group of people that say, people need intensive therapy and then, and then this works. And so we all have spent our lives generating all of this evidence-based practice, making sure we're publishing in all the right journals and stuff like that. 
And the, and the issue, the, the thing I would say is that there's lots of great things you can pull out of Berg stuff, and, there's, and, there's, and there's, there's, it's not inconsistent necessarily. But the idea is what we owe it, what we owe the people we work with is understanding what are the evidentiary bases that are out there, and we should pull and pick and choose. The thing that I just got to say, I just categorically reject is the idea that let's do this. And I think that that's a mistake. And, and you know, this isn't just brain injury. This is life. What do you know? You just sort of put all your chips in on this, your eggs in one basket, if the basket breaks, you're in trouble. And what we do, what we want to do is, and if you think about it, that framework that I've been talking about is really a very behavioral approach. Very behavioral. Um, and what you want to try to do is say, what can I pull from this, what can I pull from that? And organizationally, I think that that's something that's important for all the staff to know is that we don't want to get caught in traps. There was a program that we worked with that asked us to leave. Because they had a very specific approach that they thought was very important. And they actually wanted us to go and sort of say, wow, you guys are great. And we went and said, that's good. And they were horrified. And they were like, well, we were like, well, there's something you can change. And they were really upset. And they were like, no, this is our approach. And we know our approach works. And we're trying to figure out how we can market it and all that other kind of stuff. And I was like, no. Everything works with 25% of the population. The question is, do we have enough of a toolbox that we can pull from some of the, you're right, the first stuff is notorious. It's great for the idea of measuring in an objective way, looking at behavioral measures in a very, very, very molecular level. Um, it tends to be, it tends to be consequence focused. But they talk about environmental factors, and they talk about those discriminant stimuli, and setting events and all those kind of things. And that's all really good stuff. And it should be thought of, and it should be integrated. But the danger becomes, that's how we look at every behavior problem. And so what we want is we want people to understand that. We want people to understand a whole bunch of different things. And I think that that's the key to success. Having a framework, like I said, you it's a framework that you can plug in all kinds of evidentiary bases. So yeah, I mean, great. Yeah, very basic. Maybe it can be the point that's nothing that you can exclusive. Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah. I know it's very basic and rudimentary. But you're right. I mean, part of the deal is, like, you know, what I always say to people is that you know, it's really kind of interesting. And I'm sure not here in Australia, but everywhere else in the world. Um, once people tend to get their terminal degree, they stop looking at the literature at any kind of frequency. Not, uh, not in Australia. You guys are just amazing. Um, anyway. Um, <laughs> Actually, I'm not a clinician. I'm, I'm in the first lab, so I get to see a lot of stuff from a lot of well, but, but I mean, your point to me, but, but the point is this, is that there's, you know, there are some interesting things that we all have to keep abreast of, and I think that what happens is we try to create false dichotomies. It's either this or that. It's either this or that. And it's not. Well, like, what we want to do is we're going to have, like, I'm hoping you have a framework in your head that you can say, how, do I, how does this work? Because what I don't want people to believe is, like, this is how you do it, because you know, you, people with behavior problems, they need you to do this and this, but I want you to say, here's what I know, I gotta think about this stuff with the person, and I have to have a framework in my head, and it has to be objective, and it has to be all of those kind of things. But I can plug in a whole bunch of things around this kind of stuff, because like I said, I said this earlier, which is what worries me is when it becomes orthodox. Where it becomes, this is, our, this is our approach, because then what you're trying to do is fit people into a system. And what do we know about the people that we work with? They don't fit in anything. We can sort of shoehorn them in, but the, you know, one of the things that I always have to remind myself is that it's out there that matters, not here. And if that always guides your thought, it has a big, it should have a big impact on how you make decisions for how you're going to design intervention, how you're going to, who are you going to involve, and why you're going to involve. Like so, when we work with kids, schools. From the minute when we, when we work in, we work in a program that's a pediatric brain and rehab program, we just made it, the, it was a rule in this program that like the day we arrive, somebody's calling the school. We're not waiting until we think, until the day arrives. And we, you know, with the advent of you know, Skype and everything like that, we have kids sending stuff back and forth because we want to keep you engaged. And we want to keep not you engaged in local, but with your work, you know, that world. We want that world to stay engaged with you. We do the same, we have lots of guys that will send videos to their jobs, all that other kind of stuff. We'll have people come in from their jobs and talk about it, because we have to. Because I don't know your life, you know your life, and where are you coming from? You know, we get the Hells Angels to come in. 
help us create intervention for guys who will not sit in the pit seat on our floor. Anybody else? Sure. I work with very key players, and so often we resort to whether it's a security guard right. or candidates. Um, so, it's interesting. There was a project at uh, Morrow University and Memorial Hospital in St. John, uh, Newfoundland. So we did a whole bunch of stuff around that stuff. So they asked us to come in and they were like behavior problems and they said it's an acute hospital and I was like, oh, oh. So what do we, you know, think about it. Calm. Mechanical restraint and how well. Those are the like, you know, vitamin H. And part of the problem was that, you know, as people were talking, you know, so you have this, and everybody understood it, it's like what we're doing is we are actually um, truncating recovery by, by medicating people into the stomach. So there is some interesting thing that is not associated with brain injury, but it was something that, that it's around the sensory integration stuff. Um, so like I said, half my life were people on the autism spectrum. So that's the real hardcore behavioral people say there's no such thing as sensory integration, all that kind of stuff. But and now I'm going to tell you something that I have no evidence except just me screwing around with people. Oh, that's a long word. Um, <laughs> that's you know, enjoy, you know, just sort of interacting, especially with kids. And it's based on there's there's a uh, DePaul University, there's th uh, University of Miami, um, and there's three research sites that talk about the importance of physical touch. The literature comes out of people with Alzheimer's. What they did was with people with Alzheimer's as they got to that agitation. Now, that agitation phase in Alzheimer's is sort of similar in some ways if you kind of like blur your eyes. So that's like, you know, that Rancho, I don't know what scale, you guys probably use a Glasgow scale, but we use a Rancho scale. So that Rancho is three, four, kind of agitated, can't. Anyway, so what they would do is they would do now. Here's what was interesting. They did not do like the weighted vests and those kind of things. They did human touch starting from the core, and the idea was going through the pineal glands, and then it actually gave feedback within to your lower cortical regions. Um, so in Memorial University, we started doing that. So what happened was, and at first the nurses and everybody else was like, this is stupid. <laughs> like somebody said, do you want to get the candles, and do you want to like the bells, and stuff like that? And I was like, sure. <laughs> but from the core outward, and there's a whole bunch of stuff now. It got crazy with these guys named Will Barger, and there's a Will Barger approach, and that, that is specifically, and anybody, any EOTs who know all about that kind of stuff? And they got like, kind of like, really, that was a religion. Yeah, no, that's a religion. Um, but there's some things that, the problem is that there's some good parts of it, but anyway, so there was this whole thing about core, and what they did is they moved inside and out with human touch. Now, I really, truly, and I have no other thing except when I play with kids on the autism, I know this, that I can give them a weighty vest and all that other kind of stuff and they'll be okay, but when I'm holding on to them and I'm goofing around with them, they're looking at me. It's not just proprioceptive feedback or vestibular feedback. It's proprioceptive and, and vestibular feedback from another human being. Because what I'm learning is you are somebody <coughs> who's good. Even at those earlier stages now, in Memorial, what we found was it had a significant impact in the number of restraints and, and they reduced, now, we did not set it up as a research protocol, the medical director is like, you know, you don't, we should have done it this way, and I'm like, yeah, I'm an idiot. But the reality was, we just wanted to do some, and it was, I gotta say, act of desperation. It was, I got a theory, let's try it. And you know what, the nurses and a whole bunch of like, even like OT got really mad, that's not, that's past jobs, I just don't practice, all this other kind of stuff. But I'm like, well, what's the worst that could happen? We're holding people down and we're shooting them up. What's, what, what's worse? So we had a bunch of people who were willing to try it. So, you know, nurses are smart. And what they see is that works, I'll do that. And we did, we started, we had this whole protocol that was designed by an occupational therapist that knew a lot of that kind of stuff, and it was core outward. And what we found is that it just, it, we, we put it into the routine. So what would happen would be like when we went into the G2 feed, we had to do this whole sensory kind of feedback because, I mean, G2, bonk. You know, and what happens is, especially if people actually, people go in and they do their stuff, and then you know, like, they're separate, and then if you're flailing around, all the other kind of stuff, so it was an idea to sort of move in, not move out. And we found that in Memorial Hospital, it's sort of become a standard, it's not sort of, it's become a standard practice. And new So there's, you know, so, 
Again, let's think about it bigger. Australia's behaviors, and everybody's like saying to me stuff, I'd be like, that's a joke. But why not try it? And I, you know, my first thought was, they were like, so what are you going to do? Like, I'm the dancing monkey, you know, you're a dance monkey. And I'm like, uh, yeah. Uh, I got a theory. My theory is that there may be a strong sensory component to this kind of stuff, because if you think of the nature of brain injury and how it all works and stuff, you know, your, your, your higher cortical functions are sort of tilled, so you're really kind of more limping and subcortical a lot of it, right? So let's go to that. Sounded good, anyway. I mean, it's like. <laughs> um, and it was. It was, you know, and I think, you know what? And I said, it could be wrong, but we're going to try it. And so part of the deal is I had to do it, and I had to do it. And it was pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. But again, if you think about it, think expansively, not because what happens is we think, there's, what is the what is the current state of the science? People who are in those early stages of adaptation are unable to regulate themselves. So as a result, we have to externally regulate them. We can do that by putting them in mechanical restraints. We can do that by giving them some kind of medication. What that does is it, it, it engages there's certain subcortical regions and it helps them. Well, why not try it another way? And what, what we saw, that was, again, all anecdotal, the nurses would say, like, and there was like some of the evening nurses wouldn't do it and stuff. And so the nurses would be like, he doesn't, he's like far less agitated when I come in and I've got to give him whatever I have to plug him into than when somebody else comes in and they're just efficient. And the silly things like, you go in the door and you knock. No, he doesn't. I mean, and I'll show you, I'm sorry. You knock, and you say, hi, ah, Bill, it's me, I'm Tim. I'm going to touch you now. And I, I don't know, I have no clue if that has any effect. I don't. But here's what I see, is that I, can't, I cannot tell you that I've done a randomized control study on that. What I can tell you is by just doing that kind of thing at somebody who feels completely discombobulated, and I put my hands on them, and I'm talking to them, and I'm talking low and slow, and I'm talking about now I'm doing this, and I hope this helps you, and stuff like that. I'm regulating myself. So they're regulating themselves. And they're not even, you know, subcortical. Boy, I bet you weren't expecting that. <laughs> I work on the inpatient TBI unit here, have 15 years, and I can vouch for everything you just said. I, I use touch more so just for connection, for that social interaction, for that personalization with um, behavior patients and everything you just said, we, we do and when I do my lectures I say exactly the same, same thing. So you pulled it out of your ass too. <laughs> and, it's, I, I think that having that relationship, that connection with... But, but I, mean, yes, I, I agree with you, it's the idea is what's the quality of the relationship that you had and how do you establish a relationship with somebody who's only partially there. Yeah. Well, they're not, and you know, what, what do we do? If somebody gets upset, it happens in, it happens in uh, rehab hospitals all the time. As they get upset, we, as we elevate our, um, we change the pitch, we change the tone, we press the words, and we say, and what happens is, slow down, nice and quiet. And so you just kinda, you know, and you know, it's funny, as my friend Liz will tell you, I am not a touchy-feely kind of guy. No, not at all, my wife is not. But, but you know something? I got my hands on people all the time. Because you can learn from them. They can learn from you. And it, you know, but like I said, it's silly, but you know, I'd say that even people that were like in Rancho's one and two, you have to tell them who you are and ask their permission, even though you know they're not going to respond. What's really kind of interesting, I, you know, having done this a number of times, when people say not, I'll be like, hi, I'm Tim, I'm going to put my hand to you. And people go, uh, I'm like, wow that looked like an attempt to at least have some recognition at a very subcortical level that I don't think a person was fully conscious, but there's something working in there. But I think that the more we think in terms that are not protocol and the more we think like, what is a reasonable thing to do? What do we know? We know what do we know about neurology? You know, we know the subcortical regions guide much of our physical being. So let's get there, especially for somebody whose cortical regions are on tilt, or they're just, the circuits are not working the way that they should be. And it, you know, it's comfort. It's comfort. Anybody else? All right, so.
Making choices then. Within this framework, we're talking about the idea of making choices, and I wanted us to start thinking about this kind of stuff. Everybody talks about people's choices. You have the right to choose. Our, pro our programs are based on choice. It's a good thing, but what we need to do is figure out if it's really a choice. A choice means selecting with reason. I'm choosing because what I'm doing is I'm saying, I'm looking at an array of possibilities and I'm selecting that one. When you think about it that way, how much of the stuff that the people that we work with are doing is really a choice, and how much of it is an impulse? The impulse of the end of my nose, boom, I'm going to do this. At the end of my nose, I, 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 I'm upset, I'm going to do this. And then people will sort of recreate, you know, they'll sort of re-engineer backwards. They'll you know, reverse engineer the logic of why they did what they did and why it was a good idea. But the reality is, much of what people that we work with is actually impulsive. Now, why is that important? Because if we treat an impulse as a choice, we make people more impulsive. We're basically saying to them, it's OK just to, on the spur of the moment, make a decision. And if we work with people who never were really good at making choices because they were never good at making goals, we create all kinds of difficulties. So Dietje and Dietje and Ryan, anybody familiar at all with their intrinsic versus extrinsic uh, reinforcement stuff, uh, motivation stuff, it's really quite good. That this book, Why We Do What We Do, is now 20 years old. But it's a book that's a readable book, and it's basically, it's a, it's, it's a great frame to think about how is it and what is it that are the motivators in our life. Anyway, in that book they said, when a choice is offered, of course, it's essential that the person being offered the choice have the information necessary for making a meaningful decision. Without such information, being given a choice will feel more like a burden. <coughs> think about that. If I'm going to really make a choice, I have to have the strategy and the capacity. I have to have the information necessary in order to make that choice. If I don't have that information, and I don't have the whole picture, and you ask me to make a choice, I'm not going to make one. I will often behave in an impulsive way, but I need to have the strategy and the capacity, and I need to have the information. And we're asking people many times to make choices when they don't have the necessary tools in order to make a choice. What happens then? It's a burden. I don't want to do it. What do you go? I don't know. What do you go? I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What about it? I don't know. And then what do we do? We're so desperate. We say, how about this? How about that? And we say, okay, you chose it. But in fact, they didn't choose anything. What they were doing was just bailing out. Now, choice is one of the few things in cognitive psychology that is recognized as hierarchical. You need to be good if you think all the way at the bottom, so we think hierarchically. It's one of the few psychological constructs that is hierarchical. You've got to be good at this to get to that, to get to this, to get to that. OK, so let's think about this. Bottom, bottom line, this is what little kids, this is what babies are learning. So when babies come out fully formed, they are like, what the what? And they are just responding to internal stimuli and external stimuli. They don't really, they don't know jack. They know, what, over time, what do they learn? If I cry, someone's going to come. And either they're going to change my diaper, or they're going to feed me, or they're going to play with me. So I'm tired, I'm bored, I'm this. <coughs> I can't communicate that thing, but I know if I go, eh, eh, something's going to happen that's probably going to change because they don't know our thought process, and our thought process is, I just want you to stop, I just want you to stop, I just want you to stop, I want you to be happy, I want to see you cooing, I want all those kind of things. So what they do from the very earliest age is cause and effect learning. So you feel and remember the natural results of what you do and what happens. Let's go to people with brain injuries. For many people, they have to go, they go all the way back to that. So let's use your folks that are in the acute rehab. That's, we're teaching cause and effect. When I come here, I'm going to make you feel comfortable in your skin. <clears throat> Basic level of choice. You need to have that. Now, anybody work with uh, people with reactive attachment disorder? With what? Reactive attachment disorder. Reactive attachment disorder is common for in people who had really, really screwed up the, uh, uh, childhood, they didn't connect with anybody, often didn't have foster care, they didn't foster care, have a reactive attachment, they didn't attach. What is the evidence?